So without further ado, I'd just like to um, briefly um, welcome um, off the top of my head, knowing James for quite a few years, and particularly in um, uh, being at the presentation of his book in 2016, was a real eye opener to the work that James has done over his lifetime of being a zoologist, being involved in academia, but also getting his hands really um, in the mix of how our biodiversity works, who's influencing biodiversity and what we can do about it. So uh, his work in the uh, Discovery Centre at the museum and then with his business for nature has really enabled a lot of people to actually uh, start to really um, see what's happening in our environment and be involved in contributing to longevity and the conservation and management of some of those species. So I'd like to welcome you, James, to speak to us uh, about your work. Thank you. Thank you very much. Now, this, this evening, great. Now we can all see. Um, Jan asked me in particular to talk about hollow dependent species, but the hollow dependent species we're going to see in and around Adelaide here. Um, so most of those species are common, not all of them. And if you're a little further out, you may see some more things, but we have an abundance of wildlife. And what I'll like, oh, do it that way. Um, what I'd like to do is really go through a little bit more about hollows, why they're important to um, Australian wildlife, and in particular, um, how, how, in, how common they are here in Australia as compared to other parts of the world. Um, I guess we'll start with mammals. One in three of our terrestrial mammals relies on hollows. So they're things like dunarts, planigales, phascogales, but also things like possums and gliders. Many of them rely on hollows, which is really quite an astounding number. Uh, two out of every three of our uh, microbats rely on hollows. We think typically of bats and caves. Well, indeed, in South Australia, we have 28 species of microbat. Only two of them are what we call obligate cave users. There are six that will use caves or hollows, but the vast majority of them use hollow bearing trees or exfoliating bark. In the case of males, they'll hide under exfoliating bark, and most of this occurs in eucalypts. By comparison to the mammals, um, about one in six of our birds rely on hollows. And you might think, gee, that's not a lot. But if you compare it to the rest of the world, the next most hollow dependent um, continent is North America, where one in 10 birds rely on hollows. In Southern Africa, it's about 9%. So we have a 50% higher reliance on hollows um, than do other parts of the world. So there is really a huge reliance. Um, in addition to that, none of our vertebrate species are actually able to create those hollows in the first place. So you go to other parts of the world, uh, things like uh, woodpeckers are able to create hollows, squirrels are able to create hollows, but none of our vertebrate species can create those hollows from scratch. They are able to modify or adjust them once they're there. And there is actual talk about um, that some of the large parrots, given they are so long lived, may actually start to create um, the space where hollows can form, but still the hollows are created by other species and we'll get into that in a minute. And interestingly, of those species that are reliant on hollows, it's not just those species that benefit, the trees benefit as well. And for a whole range of reasons. Um, we have hollow dependent species that are intimately tied to these trees, and many of these species act as pest control agents within eucalypts and outside of rainforests or mangroves, 90% of our hollows historically, um, because uh, exotic species that we find in and around Adelaide and indeed many other uh, parts of Australia develop hollows. But historically, the majority of our hollows have come from uh, eucalypts. Um, And, and there's a real uh, interrelationship between them. So we've got many species like pardalotes, for example, striated pardalotes, and we'll have a look at them a little later. And they will eat 
um, the psyllids that uh, have a little dome uh, covering over them work uh, and they can eat more than 100 psyllids in a minute by comparison to some of the other uh, species that take psyllids like um, some of the miners can take them, some parrots can take them, they can take a few dozen in a minute. So there's no real comparison. Uh, possums, incredibly important in helping keep mistletoe at bay. Mistletoe is a very important um, element of the habitat because it increases uh, the sort of biodiversity by about 15%. But if you let um, mistletoe overrun an area, then the diversity comes down. So everything in balance, they help one another. In addition to that, hollow bearing trees, and we'll go into how long that takes um, shortly, but they're in the same place for 200, 300, 400, 500, sometimes 800 years. So they're sucking nutrients and minerals out of the soil and, and the um, many of the hollow dependent species and other species that take advantage of what they have to offer uh, urinating, defecating, dying, decomposing, rejuvenating or helping to contribute to that soil. And also they're very important as pollinators as well as seed dispersers, either um, straight seed or be it fruits. So many of the interrelationships are incredibly important for the success of um, the eucalypts that they rely on as well as themselves. So how do hollows form? Well, in other parts of Australia, it is different. We have a whole range of termite species. There are wet wood, there are dry wood termites. But here in South Australia, and particularly around Adelaide, we, are primar we primarily have dry wood termites. There is only one species that causes us extensive damage of wood in service. And by that, I mean building type wood. And there are about three or four other species that can cause problems for wood in the landscape. So if you're using um, uh, sleepers as retaining logs or that sort of thing, they can cause damage there. So the species that is a real issue is Copdeformis asnaciformis, um, and it will certainly do extensive damage to buildings. But there are a couple of other um, genera, Nasuta termes and um, Heterotermes, both of which uh, can impact on damp wood out in your garden or in the landscape. Um, but all of these species eat dead wood, okay? So they don't eat live wood. They can't actually penetrate if we've got a whole plant. Um, so they rely on other species as well. There are about five species of beetle. Up here we have what looks like um, a witchetty grub, but it's not a witchetty grub. It's actually the larvae of a longer corn beetle. And cerambicids, longer corns, are one of those uh, families where the beetles eat um, dead wood um, or um, they can sometimes, some of them eat live wood as well, but they actually create an ingress into which um, termites are able to get access. Some of them above the ground, some of them below the ground. And there are about five species of, oh, sorry, five families of beetles that do something similar. And there are uh, a similar number of uh, moth families that do much the same to allow termites access and it's a combination of termites and fungi that form the galleries. Um, termites uh, certainly form the galleries. They have association with certain fungal species. In fact, some species of termites actually farm fungi to help them break down and digest the cellulose. And fungi are incredibly important. Recyclers breaking down um, wood uh, and in particular, helping form hollows. And there are certain species of, of fungi that are particularly important in this. In addition to the uh, fungi and the termites, uh, bacteria are also very important as part of this process. And between these combination of species, they create the hollows in the center of these living trees. Does anyone have any idea how long it takes for hollows to form in eucalypts? Any suggestions? Gary. Okay, very good suggestion. The youngest, so the softest eucalypts, it can happen in about 70 years, but typically you're right. It takes somewhere between about 120 
and 150 years for these hollows to develop. And typically those hollows have developed within the centre of the tree for the species we're talking about, it needs access to the outside. And that usually happens through insult or injury to the tree. In this case, we have the insult or injury has been a chainsaw, but that historically has not been the case. Um, it might be your storm damage. It might be just a limb failure because uh, the limb has got too heavy or it's been drought stressed. It might also be because of fire, okay? So not only does fire expose hollows that are in the center of the tree, in large trees, it actually increases the size of those hollows because everything from uh, tiny invertebrates that are a few millimeters long are using these spaces up to our larger species is a female powerful owl, which stands about 60 centimeters tall. So the range of species that utilize hollows is really quite extraordinary. When um, heartwood gets first exposed, as we see in the top uh, um, right hand corner, uh, the wood um, has quite a high relative humidity, but as it dries out, it shrinks and cracks into that um, fungal spores land, as does bacteria. Slowly, it starts to break down the cellulose. Um, over time, parrots in particular will have a go at that wood and slowly but surely, the cavities within the middle of the tree get exposed to the outside. And that's how a vertebrate species start to take advantage of these hollows. So the sort of species, um, and many of us think of just hollows up in trees, but in fact, hollows are incredibly important from under the ground to ground level um, and up through the tree to the higher parts of the canopy and a range of species take advantage of it from possums, um, kingfishers like the kookaburra, bat species, and even things like lizards. And indeed, hollows are incredibly important for many of our uh, freshwater aquatic species as well. Things like um, yellow belly or Murray cod. Uh, many of the invertebrates rely on those hollows as, as hiding places as well. That is, sorry, what well, can be in both, but it certainly is in the fallen timber. And, and indeed, one of the things about all of the um, creeks we have uh, across Adelaide is they've all been cleared to try and prevent flooding, which is obviously really important, but historically flooding was actually quite common along creek lines and creeks would meander through and we had lots and lots of pools. I went chasing um, some tadpoles the other day uh, for an educational event um, that we have on. Oh, sorry. Um, I wander around, Jerry. I'm sorry about that. I, <laughs> I went chasing some tadpoles the other day and because of the rain we've had recently, um, all of the water was fast flowing. There are very few pools. It took me about an hour and a half, two hours to find eight tadpoles, which was really sad down one of our major creeks uh, running through Adelaide. Whereas if I was to go to a dam with spill water, we probably would have found them quite quickly. So going back to our trees, natural hollows are incredibly important. They have benefits that artificial hollows or hollows created by us don't have. The first and probably most important is um, their temperature regulation. So on a hot day like you or I, a tree transpires. So it takes in moisture through its roots and it releases it through its leaves to keep itself cool. As a consequence, um, there was some work done up in Arbury Park um, Outdoor Education School in the hills where they found on a 40 degree day outside within a hollow, it was less than 30 degrees. It was about 28, 29 degrees. So that's really quite important. And they found also on those really cool days, it was much warmer inside the hollow than it was outside. So um, having a fluctuation of somewhere between 15 and 20 degrees as compared to about 40 degrees means that it's much more comfortable for these animals that rely on these hollows. Um, in addition, the relative humidity is much more stable within the hollows as um, nest boxes, for example, heat up and cool down. It becomes a very dry, arid environment by comparison. 
So wherever possible, we need to try and retain these natural hollows in the landscape. Um, and the tree on the right hand side we have up here was about 25 metres tall and it was just under two metres wide. This photo was taken a number of years ago and I walked around the base of that tree and I was able to count about 10 plus hollows within this particular red gum um, that was in Morialta Conservation Park and they were just the ones I could see. And it was about this time in spring and that it was just full of birds, really quite extraordinary. Historically, we would have probably had across the Adelaide Plains and the foothills, somewhere between 12 to 15 hollow bearing trees per hectare. Depending on where you are, if you're really lucky, you might have three or four at the moment, but often we have none. Okay, so that's really a really sad situation. And we need to retain these hollow bearing trees wherever they exist in the landscape. Um, there has been a real shift probably over the last 10 to 15 years. Um, arborists and, and councils would historically say, look, these trees have hollows, they're dangerous, we'll remove them. More and more so these trees are being retained in the landscape and the risks associated with them. Um, so where limbs may fail, they just reduce the structure. So it doesn't, it doesn't present as big a risk as it did um, historically. So, they retain those assets of those hollows within the tree, but also really important, the genetics of the tree. Artificial hollows, I spend an awful lot of time, as Jan said, managing um, hundreds and hundreds of uh, wildlife boxes across Adelaide, uh, some for personal uh, or private individuals, but many of them are for, for councils or advise government about how we manage some of these hollow dependent species. Anytime we are going up at height, once you go over about um, a metre off the ground, most um, heights injuries occur less than two metres off the ground. So anytime we are going up at height, we need to be really conscious of safety aspects. So we use ladders, but we actually use climbing gear and ladders to try and keep ourselves safe and, and I've helped or we trained some people on how to do this sort of thing. Um, hollows, uh, as I said earlier, artificial hollows don't replace the natural hollows, but when we talk about the time frame over which it takes natural hollows to actually um, become available over a hundred years, um, often we can't wait that long and, and we will have spaces throughout the city uh, where we need to try and manage. Um, and fortunately, at the end of the uh, talk, I'll look a little bit about some recent developments that have occurred, because um, some of these hollows, uh, hollow bearing trees, we're talking, as I said, four, five, six hundred years old, incredibly important in the landscape. Now, um, I guess where we'll have a look at is some of the most common species, because I, I often get asked by councils and, and private individuals chasing rare or unusual species. And rare or unusual species are typically rare or unusual because of how we've changed the landscape, how we've changed the habitat, the resources or elements they need in that landscape are not necessarily there. Um, and often a limiting factor is not hollows. Um, it will be some other case and, and there's a case in point a little later we'll talk about. But if you are to put up hollows, um, and um, we have several councils that have hundreds of boxes up between them, and over 90% of those hollows are typically used on a 12 monthly basis. And the number one species we tend to see are rainbow lorikeets. Rainbow lorikeets uh, were certainly here in 1836, but this was probably the extent of their range, and they are now. Uh, probably um, a survey that was done by a PhD student, I think about eight or nine years ago, found them the most numerous species in the landscape. And they were also found in the most uh, diverse habitat types of any species that were available across Adelaide. So they are now the number one bird we tend to see. Um, they only lay two eggs. They have a very short elementary canal because they're primarily taking nectars, um, fruits and pollens. So um, I've been up uh, looking at 
natural hollows as well as nest boxes. This guy actually on the right hand side doesn't look too bad, but I have seen chicks wandering around in feces that is about three or four centimeters deep, sharing it with the maggots from certain species of fly that specialize in eating this sort of feces. Um, so if, um, and, and in certain cases, if they have any more than two eggs, it might be that the chicks actually drown because I've seen them, as I said, wandering around waist deep in feces on occasions. It is just astounding. Um, and, and so they have two eggs. Um, uh, typically both chicks hatch. This is probably a chick that's only a day or two old at the bottom. And then by the time it's about two, two and a half weeks, um, it looks like uh, this little chap on the right hand side. And then just before fledging, they look exactly like adults, except rather than having uh, the, the really bright red bill they have, they have a very dark, dusky red bill. Um, so these guys are probably only going to be two or three days off fledging, if that. And they will have spent the last four, four weeks plus within that cavity as a chick. And before that, probably at least three weeks as an egg. So it is quite an extended time, even for those two chicks, um, for something like um, Adelaide rosellas or Eastern rosellas. It's more like two and a half months. So uh, while uh, <coughs> rainbow lorikeets will only lay two eggs, um, we have two rosella species locally. Uh, the Adelaide rosella, which is uh, a subspecies of the crimson rosella, um, it will lay up to eight eggs. And one of the differences with the rainbow lorikeet is there are three elements to um, a cavity that is important for whatever wildlife species going to use it. So probably the first one is entrance size. The entrance needs to be just large enough for the species to be able to get access to that hollow, but small enough to exclude anything bigger that is potentially a threat. Uh, the second thing is we need an appropriate floor area. If you are imagine this room to be your bedroom, many of us would feel uncomfortable sleeping in a room of this size because we've become accustomed to a certain size. And animals are very much the same. Um, I rarely find small animals in really large spaces. They just don't feel comfortable in there. Um, so it works in that way, but also alternatively, if you have a relatively small floor area, so where we could only uh, raise two rainbow lorikeets, um, a rosella would modify the number of eggs it can lay uh, to take advantage of that floor area. So it might lay three, it might lay four eggs. Whereas an Adelaide rosella can actually lay up to eight. In this case, there are six eggs in the bottom of this uh, particular box. And really interestingly, that was um, from my backyard when I used to live on the Hill Space Zone. It was a tree about equidistant from my house uh, to the workshop where we built these things and I parked my car. I was walking back and forth multiple times a day over the two and a half months that these chicks we're going from the egg phase, as you see here, to the chicks up on the right-hand side. They virtually take up the whole floor area. You can see a tiny little bit of floor area up there. And in that time, I saw the adult birds only three times. So I saw them before the first eggs were laid. I saw them about halfway through. And I saw them literally as the birds were at this stage, which was about a week and a half, two weeks before they finally fledged. All of those chicks fledged. I do have some footage and other photographs where they've laid eight eggs in a box of a similar size and there is no room on the floor at all. So in essence, the adult, the, the hen, is hanging onto the edge of the box to feed the chicks once they get to this sort of stage. So um, that's an Adelaide rosella. The other species um, that we find um, in Adelaide is an Eastern rosella. Interestingly, the Adelaide rosella, as young, uh, don't have adult plumage. They have this green plumage, yet from very young, once they get rid of their downy feathers, um, the eastern rosellas start to develop uh, their typical bright red, green and blue plumage. Now, one of the, this species in particular, I have found 
absolutely fascinating. Early on, we had, uh, and we've been, we've had boxes up in trees since, on, on mass, probably since about 2008, 2009. And for the first five or six years, we had no um, galahs use these boxes at all. We had galahs look at them. We had galahs increase the entrance size to them. We had galahs chew them sometimes to the extent that they would actually make them inoperable because they've opened up the top uh, and let the rain in. <laughs> but over the last three or four years, as we went moved to a different council area, um, we've started finding that the glass have moved in and are really interested in using boxes. Um, often uh, parrots have beaks that grow throughout their lives. So if you imagine a, a two or a three-year-old, everything is picked up or put in their mouth to test it. Parrots are exactly the same. They test everything with their mouth. They test everything with their beak. And as a consequence, uh, when we put in some brand new boxes, uh, about four or five, oh, yeah, about four or five, I think. So that was around about 10% um, were shredded to the point that they had to be replaced straight away. And um, that year, as in within the next breeding season. Um, and one of the things we found was uh, that within about two, three, four years, uh, we quadrupled the number of galahs that we're using boxes, but they weren't chewing them to the point where they were unusable again. So they were learning and we were wondering, I mean, it's, it's formed a really interesting question because we went from no galahs to actually last year, I think we had seven galahs um, that were using them and the damage to the boxes was less than a third, they would still increase the entrance size, but much of the rest of it, they would leave be. So are they learning? Is this an ad adaptation? We don't know, but it's an incredibly interesting question. And um, because use of boxes uh, is a really interesting question in itself. They are naturally geared. Of the 54 species of parrots we have here in Australia, 48 of them use hollows. Okay, there are a couple like the night parrot and the ground parrot that nest on the ground. Um, there are some that nest in termite mounds, but the vast majority use hollows. And, and some of them won't use anything else. Some species like the Adelaide rosella we were seeing before, I get calls every year because they chew out fascia boards to try and get access to roof spaces to nest there. I even know that rosellas have nested in chimneys. Whereas lorikeets don't tend to do this. These guys don't tend to do this. They all have their own personalities. But in particular, once these guys, the glass, learned that this was an appropriate breeding space, they seem to have taken off quicker than many of the other species. So they're probably one of the species that is on the rise at the moment. And a whole range of other species um, are found, parrot species are found around Adelaide, we certainly had musk lorikeets and red rumps choose our boxes, although um, the red rumps weren't in Adelaide. Um, a little further out, uh, mulga parrots, um, elegant parrots, blue ring parrots, there are potential at all of these, but we haven't had any of them used. Um, oh, I've missed soft crested cockatoos. There you go. Um, yellow tailed black cockatoos, we have done some trial work on some yellow-tailed cockatoo, black cockatoo boxes on KI. Um, so it's still a watch this space. And to date, we haven't seen little corellas or long-billed corellas use boxes either, but all of these are highly dependent species. Possums. We have three species of possum locally. We have ring-tailed possums up in the top left-hand corner. Uh, typically that will be a mum there and she's got two offspring, uh, one directly underneath her and one at the back. Um, they tend to have uh, two that they breed once a year. They also are not what we call obligate hollow users. They build their own dray, which is a spherical nest, probably about 30 centimetres across, often in quite dense foliage, although it can be up in eucalypts, and they can be as low as a metre, metre and a half off the ground in the right sort of environment. 
Um, but we have a lovely little park in Myrtle Bank uh, where we put in these boxes and we started out with literally one or two um, of the ringtail possums. And there was only young eucalypts that were just large enough to hold boxes at the time. Um, and about um, eight or nine years on, we ended up having um, a similar number, about uh, nine or 10 ringtail possums that we use in this corner of the park that historically only had one because of access to suitable breeding environments. Uh, probably the biggest uh, or most common possum we have is the brush tail possum. And again, um, fascinating. Uh, we've had parks that have gone from no possums to four or five possums in them. Uh, quite a number of councils will put in possum boxes if they're removing trees and there's considered to be uh, a potential invasive threat of these possums if hollow dependent, uh, sorry, hollow bearing trees are taken away and the homes of these animals are lost, that they might try and get into uh, uh, roof spaces. So as a consequence, some really proactive councils will put up possum boxes to try and avoid or reduce that potential conflict. Um, and possums can be from, uh, or brush tails can be from one and a half kilos up to about four kilos. And that's another good reason to be tied onto a tree because it hasn't, it's not uncommon for me to be six meters up a tree and go to check what's in a box and have a male possum <laughs> bolt at me like this and meet me at the door and say, go away and leave me alone in no uncertain terms. So it's got nothing to do with um, uh, him wanting to have a go at me. He's just trying to defend himself. And I've had over the years I've done this, being used as a highway as a possum's run across my back <laughs> to escape and other things. So, so I really rely on that. Uh, connection and the rope. Um, and occasionally with the right sort of research and um, Elisa Sparrow from the Department for Environment uh, did some lovely work in five conservation parks down on the Southern Fluria uh, going back a number of years where she got some Western pygmy possums and they had 40 purposeful boxes for pygmy possums out at um, a particular conservation park. And I think over the course of about the 18 months that she was doing the most intensive research until it all changed, um, all of them had been taken over at one stage or another, either by these guys, pygmy possums, or by a yellow-footed antichinus. And, and this was the first research of this kind that we had done, and we learned a really fascinating lesson. Um, antichinus are considerably bigger um, than these uh, uh, pygmy possums. And we thought we'll make an entrance which is too small for a sparrow to get in at 22 mils. And that should be enough just for the pygmy possum and should keep everything else out. The antichinus could still get in. So as a consequence, I went back to the museum and we measured the skull sizes of antichinus and we measured some skull sizes of pygmy possums. And we found we could probably drop the entrance size, if we specifically wanted pygmy possums to about 18 millimeters. So that would exclude the antichinus. We could still do antichinus probably at 22 to 25 millimeters. But if we did it at 18 millimeters, then we would only get the target species. So we are learning all the time. There is so much we don't know. And that was just uh, such a valuable project and a really interesting piece of work. Um, the other aspect, about that piece of work is these boxes were out in five conservation parks. I think only two where they thought it was the right habitat had uh, pygmy possums and only one actually had an extensive number. Um, are there limited hollows in these Okay, that's a really good question. Now, um, of these species of possum, uh, the only one that is an obligate hollow user, which means it must use the hollow, is a brush tail possum. Okay, ring tails, as I said, form drays. Pygmy possums actually will often go into grass trees or thickets of banksias and that sort of thing and make their own nest. Uh, ring tail possums bring nesting material into a box. Um, pygmy possums also bring nesting material into the box. And one of the other aspects about the work that was really obvious, you knew which was a pygmy possum and which was an antichinus because the pygmy possum always brought in fresh green brows, whereas 
the antichinist, any old leaves would do. So you go into one that's full of dead leaves, three quarters full, and you knew exactly what you're going to find in there or what had been in there. And the same thing, as you can see, these fresh eucalypt leaves that they had brought in. So they don't just use this and they probably use it at different, different times of the year. So if it's really hot, they won't be inside a box because that will probably be hotter. Um, they will want breeze and that sort of thing. So they'll be in vegetation. But colder parts of the year, wetter parts of the year, they're real benefits. Or if they're looking to protect young, they're real benefits from a box as compared to other places they may roost. Okay. Um, and the other interesting aspect about this is we think of, oh, one animal will use a box. If you have a close look, this is a ringtail possum in a small parrot box. On the right hand side is a fragment of an egg. And indeed, if you have a look, close look on the left hand side, there is a bright green feather. And just underneath it is a red feather. So, in all likelihood, that was a rainbow lorikeet that nested. It finished. Um, the uh, ringtail possum came in. And I've had similar sorts of things. Again, when I was living on the hills face zone, uh, typically ringtail possums um, will use hollows, particularly in winter, because their dray structure is really quite flimsy at the top. It'll take off light rain, but not heavy rain and not continuous rain we get in winter. So that's in particular in this part of Australia where they seek out hollows. And um, in a pine where there was no hollows in my backyard, we had up a, a ringtail possum box and the possum would use that box through until about the end of August, early September, it would vacate. And every year, four years in a row, we had a, a pair of Adelaide Rosella that would wait for it to leave. It would then choose down the, chew down the dray that the ringtail possum had created to make a bed for itself, and then it would rear its young. So it was just fascinating to watch. And they don't read the instructions on the box. So just because we say this is for a ringtail possum, <laughs> they choose to believe it sometimes. All right, bats. Now bats is a really interesting one. Um, I'll just put a safety warning out here. Bats, um, or in particular micro bats, can carry lysivirus. There have been no bats um, detected with lysivirus here in South Australia, but there have been bats that are detected uh, that have antibodies to lysivirus detected here in South Australia. Lysivirus is a variant of rabies, um, and it can it has there have been three deaths as a consequence in South and not in South Australia in Australia, um, uh, uh, in Northern Territory in Queensland, I do believe. So just if you're if you're dealing with bats, um, whether they're alive or they're dead, unless you've had a rabies shot please don't pick them up, just be aware of it. Um, now the species that tend to um, utilize uh, artificial hollows, up on the left hand side, uh, sorry, right hand side, we have um, at the chocolate wattle bat. Um, and that's the species I've seen most often. Um, certainly in Victoria, uh, this chap with the mane is a Gould's wattle bat and they are often, often use hollows as well. Occasionally, things like lesser long-eared bats will use them. Uh, we don't see bats very often. However, we regularly see the droppings of bats. So if you imagine a, um, a mouse, these droppings are about that size. But as compared to mouse droppings, which are really quite dense and, and full of fibres, you crush these and it's full of lots of little insect bits, not surprisingly, given that's what they feed on and they're quite friable. And I had only seen until relatively recently when we were doing some work down at Douglas Scrub, um, yeah, maybe two dozen, three dozen, or occasionally one or two droppings in the bottom. Uh, we went down and looked at some boxes down at Douglas Scrub. And this had, I kid you not, about five centimetres of bat droppings in the bottom of this box. It was just extraordinary. And there are about eight to 10 of these that have been out for seven years, something like that. And all but one of them had this in the bottom of the box. And indeed, again, not reading the instructions, incredibly frustrating. Yeah. 
this guy was in a puddle oak box, which was subsequently taken over by ants. And this guy had died. It's one of the wattle bats, and we're not sure which one. Um, but literally, they are ants' eggs. And you can see the ants there. The ants had taken over the puddle oak box after the bat had died and were feasting on it. And the really extraordinary thing, I got up and had a look at this box and called out to Jan. They had made a cover over the entrance to the box out of the fur of this bat. And it was going in and out in the breeze. And I'd never seen anything like it before. So I've been doing this for 15 years and certainly on a yearly basis, maybe not on a daily basis, I am seeing things that astound me all the time. So bats, incredibly important in the landscape and, and certainly uh, use boxes as well. Um, they take longer, however, to uptake boxes than, than parrots or possums. So we're going through an order of probably how commonly things take things up. Kingfishers, we have two kingfishers locally. The largest is the laughing kookaburra. As compared to all of the boxes we've seen until now, which have been basically vertically box, vertical boxes, these guys like horizontal boxes. And the reason they like horizontal boxes is because the young sidle up to the entrance and squirt out of the entrance in most cases. <laughs> Not in all cases, as you can see, the whitewash all around there. Um, and this was just full of little lizard bones and a whole range of other things. This was actually in uh, one of our, uh, the car parks in, uh, we managed some boxes for rail care, and this is in one of the car parks of one of the stations up in the hills. That people parking every morning, they're a breeding pair of kookaburras that are taking advantage of. So many species of wildlife will actually put up with us as neighbours in really quite close proximity. Um, on at one of the kookaburra boxes that was down at Douglas Scrub, um, this is me in my climbing gear I, down there with Jan. Um, it needed to be taken off because it was uh, coming close to falling off in this case. And this was all of the, that material that had been scraped out. And again, there were lots of little bones. But one of the things I found in there, which we didn't take a photograph of and we cursed later, but was a mummified frog. So at some stage, this kookaburra had taken the frog uh, and it was probably a, um, a spotted marsh frog or a Hobble bonk or something like that, because it was a really one of the large, chunkier frogs, but it was just so shriveled we couldn't tell. Um, uh, it was left in there, so they must have tried to feed it to the young, and for whatever reason, it got ignored and then just died in the box. So, again, not something I'd seen before. Really fascinating. Um, the other one, and I've had two councils approach me about this particular bird, which is a sacred kingfisher. Um, they certainly do uh, come this far south to breed in summer. Um, they're, a, they're found in creek lines and that sort of thing, particularly up in the hills. But um, even uh, down here uh, or just up the road in Unley, um, we've had uh, breeding pairs reported. But on two different occasions, I've had councils say, right, we want to target this particular species to try and attract them with follows. And I've said, Look, in the, in the case of this animal, it's lack of habitat, they need running water, they need a range of other things. And it's probably not the hollow that this animal is missing. Um, still, they want it, we go ahead and do it, but um, there are many other factors that come into play about why species are here or not here. Owls, we have two species of owl. One is really ubiquitous across Adelaide. You will all hear the boo book on probably 80 nights, sorry, 80% of the year. I live along a creek line and without fail, whether it's the middle of winter or middle of summer, I hear boo books from about two hours after dark through until almost sun up. And it's probably one of my favorite calls, them and pobble bonks. Um, they, <laughs> they certainly do use nesting boxes. Um, they prefer hollows. They're one of the harder species to try and attract. By contrast, barn owls, um, we, we do have them. They're often a fringe species in Adelaide. And the only the times I have tended to see them of when there have been mouse plagues elsewhere 
So they're an eruptive species. They take advantage of mouse plagues and their numbers build up, build up and then the young disperse. And in particular, after a couple of those mouse plagues is when I've more often seen barn owls around Adelaide. But in this case, um, we did, this is a, uh, in the grain belt in WA and they had rodents everywhere. And this guy ended up putting up four of these boxes and these owls were just breeding again and again and again while they were young. About four years ago, it might've been five years ago, we did um, some work with Adelaide Uni and a student who was looking at barn owls as a potential pest management um, option uh, from the perspective that if you go over to uh, North America, voles rather than rats, but uh, uh, similar sort of situation, they often impact in vineyards. And about every 400 metres around um, these vineyards, they would put up boxes that barn owls would take advantage of. And as a consequence, um, the uh, vole population is kept way down. So impact on fruit is also kept way down. Uh, over in uh, York Peninsula, and, and unfortunately they didn't catch the start of the mouse plague, it was later on, but this is an area that has been extensively cleared. Um, out of three survey nights, I think they only saw two barn owls. Um, so they put up 11 boxes. Um, unfortunately, one was put up in the wrong place. Um, I think three boxes were taken up within a month. Um, something like seven or eight boxes were taken up within three months. One of these owls fledged six chicks and they counted something like 3,600 prey items that had been brought back to these boxes and all but one of the boxes had been taken over in some way, shape or form. Um, eight of them having breeding events um, literally in, in a 10 month time frame. So uh, in spaces where we have denuded the landscape of important resources, certain species will adapt really quickly and take advantage of them. Uh, and another group is ducks, in particular wood ducks. Surprise this poor hen when I just, this, and this is in a, again, not reading the instructions, she's in a brush tail possum box, um, but stuck my head in. Again, you know, it's been used multiple times. There she is, that's her egg. Um, and indeed they can be communal nesters. I have been to hollows where I have counted 21 eggs and I have been in, our, in one of our boxes where there have been 13 chicks and, and that's not from one hen. Down in the bottom, you'll see again, rainbow lorikeet feathers. So they've used the box for either roosting or nesting. Um, as you can see, uh, when we first came across this, the, the chap, because I, I, I wasn't fortunate enough to um, be there, uh, but one of the chaps that does this for us said it was just a seeding mass of what he thought was fur until he looked closer and, and there were all these little um, ducklings. And when they vacate, it's just a mass of eggshells and feathers. Um, the other ducks, and we have had grey teal um, nest in some of our boxes or one of our boxes. I haven't got photographs of that, unfortunately. Uh, grey teal, chestnut teal, um, certainly a hollow nesters as are Pacific black ducks. So there are a range of other ducks in other parts of the country. There are also more ducks, uh, some of the larger ducks um, uh, like shell duck, et cetera, that do breed in hollows, but you're not gonna find them this close to that place. So. Other birds, one of my favorites, pardalotes. Um, so this little guy, he can actually make his own burrow in the ground as does um, the closely related uh, spotted pardalote, um, but will often uh, nest or often nest in hollows and will take advantage of nesting boxes. And again, when we were down in Douglas Scrub, um, uh, there was a box I was checking and it needed attention because um, uh, the, uh, as the tree had grown, uh, we needed to manage the box. And I had a look there, it was just full of grass. And this is way in the back of the box. And this is not a big box. It's only about, I think, 125 um, millimetres long or something. And right in the back third was tucked this. And there was an entrance where the birds had arrived. Then there was a grass tunnel 
and at the back was this. And I managed to take photographs of, of these three little chicks there in the back while the mum and dad were scolding me from just above my head. And indeed, not reading the instructions, we had back droppings that was about two centimetres thick in the bottom of another pardalote box over which a pardalote has built its nest as well. So um, in the right locations where the species are, um, they get used again and again. Sometimes we have species we don't want. Um, so occasionally we will get a blackbird nesting. They're not known as um, hollow nesters, but they certainly do quite like nesting in thickets or quite confined spaces. Um, and starlings are a notorious hollow nester. Uh, they are quite dirty birds. Um, so they have lice and they have mites and many species won't go in a hollow for quite some time after they've been there. But they are also really intelligent like our parrots are, um, but they nest in families. So they will drive other species off. And I've seen a box that stands about half a metre tall with two thirds of it filled with garbage. Um, it could be plastic, it could be leaves, it could be grasses, just so they have a nice bed just below the entrance, which is where they want it. Um, so if they move in, other species don't. Fortunately, their numbers seem to be decreasing and um, we don't see them very often, thankfully, but it depends on the location. And these guys are just fabulous. Um, this was uh, in um, a boo book box, but they're actually Alet Nightjar chicks. So again, we don't get Alet Nightjars right here in Adelaide, but I've got photographs of them at Laratinga Wetlands up at Mount Barker. And, and these are a species that use hollows all year round. So they don't only use hollows to nest, they use hollows as roosting sites year round to escape things like goannas and hydrogen. So just fabulous, the range of species that will use them. Um, the other taxa we encounter, very commonly um, we see uh, marble geckos, uh, spiders, particularly huntsmen, occasionally things like black house spiders or daddy long legs, ants occasionally take over. And one of our biggest issues is bees. Okay, so in this case, it is literally a swarm that has only just established itself. But uh, we have beehives and that's a brush tailed possum box, which stands about 25 by 30 centimeters square and just under half a meter deep, absolutely chockers. So they're coming out and that would weigh probably 30 to 35 kilos. Um, so as Jan said, that can be a bit of a challenge to try and extract. Fortunately, I'm working with a group at the moment um, with the Beekeeper Society of South Australia, where we're creating capture boxes to try and capture these swarms, and take them out of the environment. All right, now very quickly as we finish up, very, you can't, for the first 10 years of a tree's life, um, it's not large enough to take a nest box or really there's not much from a cavity perspective we can do with it. Um, and what we're aiming to do is keep those hollow bearing trees that are 200 plus years old in the landscape, but we can do things in the interim. So between about 10 years and 80 years, we can install wildlife boxes or nesting boxes. Once they get to about um, 80 years old, these trees are often substantial enough, even though they don't have their own hollows, that skilled arborists can actually put carved hollows within these trees. And that's better than his nesting boxes because again, there's more insulation. Um, it reflects natural environments better than does the nesting box, but it's not as good as the eventual hollow. So these are some arborist um, colleagues I work with. They cut a face plate off a tree. Um, then they carve a cavity within the tree itself, um, knock that cavity out, put a hollow back, uh, sorry, put the entrance back over it. Um, and initially they were putting the entrance in the face plate as we call it, but they found that face plates would fail. So subsequently they put hollows in the back side of the tree and they get taken up 
and really quickly, just like a natural hollow. So we now have three different options and these uh, sorts of hollows if put in the right uh, location will be in the landscape for decades. So that's just fantastic. Typically they're done from elevated work platforms as you see here, and they can be incredibly effective. And some of the most progressive councils are starting to use this sort of technology. Uh, monitoring, I take photographs in everything I do. Um, there are other ways to monitor. This is actually a trail camera. So this is a hollow, that spout was there, but there was no cavity behind it. So they cut off the back, made a cavity, then put it up um, into that spout and put that face plate back on. The top is a red rump looking, inspecting the hollow, two rainbow lorikeets. And, and yeah, we'll often see that, but what we don't often see is the sort of activity at night. This same hollow, um, there's a brush tail possum coming to the hollow, and there's a booble gal sitting on top of the hollow and looking down into it. Um, some recent research has said they will take up these sorts of hollows probably as effectively as they do natural hollows because to all intents and purposes, that's what they look like to these animals. Threats, um, domestic pets, particularly cats are a real issue as are foxes. Uh, feral bees is still the second biggest threat to hollow dependent fauna. But as are um, unwanted species or, or pest species locally, that includes um, st common st or European starlings, um, the Indian miner, and that's M-Y-N-A-H, not M-I-N-E-R, the um, noisy miner, which is a honey eater. Uh, the mi this miner is actually in a starling family. Um, they are on the East Coast and they are very aggressive around hollows, fortunately they aren't here. And if we hear them arriving, the Department for Environment um, takes care of them. But then there are also species like the rainbow lorikeet, which is a pest in WA. It was never found there. And escapees from um, aviculture have mean, uh, meant that this has become a dominant bird over there, displacing their natural fauna. So we're impacting our environment in all manner of way. And we really need to be conscious of that. But still, the single biggest threat to hollow dependent species is the removal of habitat. Okay, and that's something in this day and age you would think is really within our control. We need to be planning over hundreds of years to manage the hollows in our landscape. Unfortunately, our political environment does it over about four or five years if we're lucky. Okay, in conclusion, um, we're never going to get back across Adelaide to the sorts of environments we see up in conservation parks in the hills, but we need to retain hollows in the landscape because there are wildlife that need them and that will share our environment with us if they retain. Where we can't retain them, um, wildlife boxes is certainly a fantastic way to get that wildlife close to you and retain species that might struggle otherwise. But I guess the long and short of it is we have species that are dependent on hollows as they are on many other aspects of the environment. Most people wouldn't realize that brush-tailed possums used to be found over about 85% of the state. They're now found over 25% of the state and they're listed as rare in South Australia. There are only three places they are still considered common. Southern Mount Lofty Ranges, the Adelaide Plains and Kangaroo Island. And one of the reasons I'm so passionate about this particular animal, and I'm aware it creates polarization in the community, is because if we can lose or get to that stage with a species that has been that common, what species is safe? And unless we do something about it, within my son's lifetime, the only place he may see a brush-tailed possum is in the zoo, the museum, or maybe a long linear park, but that's going to be about it. What sort of legacy are we leaving for future generations? Thank you very much. There's one question, one question on the chat from Charmaine, and I'm just going to get her to ask it. If, uh, if Hello. <laughs> Yeah, my question was, what particular species of eucalypts uh, ordinarily form hollows? 
No, is uh, it just mainly red gums or pink gums, blue gums, whatever? Virtually all species of hollows form, uh, sorry, virtually all species of eucalypts form hollows. Blue gums, red gums, manna gums, pink gums, uh, the stringy barks, they may, um, uh, it may take longer in some species than others, but the other really nice aspect about all the eucalypts is because they're so hard, many of these hollows are lasting many decades. So they go from a really small size to what may be a large size over many, many years. So they're a valuable resource in the landscape. Okay, so the question is, there have been uh, a number of boxes on a property that have been taken over by bees. Um, uh, one was during a breeding event and, and the clutch failed. Uh, another one was, um, uh, so that involved Adelaide Rosellas, another one involved Rainbow Lorikeets. Once the bees were removed, um, birds haven't come back and taken up residence again. Uh, that's really interesting um, insofar as um, if the comb is still there, sometimes we've seen, yeah, sometimes we've seen that uh, it hasn't been taken up. But more recently, and I'm talking probably over the last five or six years, we've seen situations where possums will actually chew out and get rid of that comb. Sulfur-crested cockatoos will. And we certainly had uh, quite a lot of boxes that have been used previously by um, honeybees uh, where the wax has been denatured uh, get taken over because that must happen on a regular basis where the wax has been in there. It won't be to do with smell at all with the birds because the birds you're talking about really don't have a sense of smell that that will borrow it, uh, would bother them. Um, it may well be uh, that those individuals being a traumatic experience haven't come back to that, but why something else hasn't taken up I don't know because we've certainly had situations where that has been the case and they've taken advantage of that hollow once it's become available. And we've had that both where I've been managing them or where they've been out on council land. So one of the intricacies, there are many things we know about them, but there are many more things such as that that I just can't answer. Sorry about that. The bees, um, we had about 25 boxes of bees in. And what we did is we took them, took them to pieces completely. Uh, and uh, following James' advice, uh, we burned the whole, all six sides with a you know, gas torch and then sanded them basically back to their wood. But so, that, that was more around um, the matrix. So the wax and the honey um, have a pheromone that will attract other bees. And the reason we did that is that reduces the likelihood of the bees seeing this as a location where bees have taken up occupation before and are more likely to take up occupation again. So that's around dissuading the bees access rather than um, the animals taking up residence. Okay, I've got one at the front first. Can you recommend a set of plans for your Look, there are lots and lots of set of plans that are now available. There's a brilliant book um, by Alan and Stacey Franks on nest boxes. They come from Queensland, so some of them need to be slightly adapted, but it is a fantastic book. Um, Karingai Chase um, uh, Council over in Sydney makes available lots of plans. So it depends what you want to target, but I'm quite happy for you to chat to me later, but there are lots of really good plans available on, on the internet. Um, Birds Australia or Bird Life Australia um, has recommendations and sizes and that sort of thing. So they are readily available to be found. And in fact, there are a few men's sheds around the place that knock the odd box together as well. So. Okay. After, after the um, big fires we had 18 months ago, two years ago, um, lots of men's sheds or private individuals have actually got together and made uh, wildlife boxes of various sorts to put up in the hills or put over on KI uh, to try and help attract support um, various forms of wildlife. But if you have a local men's shed, and I know they're scattered uh, in most council areas around Adelaide, and you approach them, 
uh, they have often at some stage in the past built them or would be happy to help people do? Great question. Okay, how, how do you affix a box to a tree? And there's a whole range of ways uh, to potentially do it. Historically in Australia, we have by and large wired the boxes to trees. Um, anytime you do that, the wire needs to be sleeved so it doesn't constrict um, the growth of the tree because one of the biggest issues about uh, boxes that are not appropriately maintained is they constrict and potentially kill the tree. Often associated with that, you need some sort of spring mechanism so you can tell, oh, the wire needs to be changed. Um, uh, given the embedded risk associated with that, uh, we actually bolt boxes to trees. Now, the benefit of that is you have a relatively modest um, insult to the tree and the tree in all cases keeps growing. So it keeps growing if there's a wire there such that it restricts the ability for the xylem and phloem to work so it doesn't get the nutrients or water that it needs, hence why it kills the tree. The benefit, and, and I got this from the UK, where their boxes are all really small boxes, they tend to nail them to trees. And if we could find the right combination of depth of nail, gauge of nail, and zinc application, whereby the tree actually grows and pops the box off with it while maintaining it on the tree, that would be the ideal scenario. But there's a lot of research to go into that. We use two bolts, and if they get maintained, they can get taken off and spaces go between the box and the tree to allow room for the tree to grow. And if they aren't maintained, the tree eventually says, I'm going to take you off the tree. And the growth of the tree, given they can lift curbs, is able to remove that box. And that's why um, when they're put in places, they're put in uh, safe locations. So if they do come off because they aren't maintained, there's no risk underneath the tree. So typically over garden beds and that sort of thing. All right, we've got a question over the back there. How close together can you put them off? Uh, that's a great question. It very much depends on the species you want to target. Oh, how close together do you put the boxes? Sorry, was the question. So um, when we did early work with um, pardalot boxes, for example, uh, the conventional wisdom at the time was you need a box that was about half a metre long and a PVC tube. So the pardalot would think it was a tube, would fly in, and what we found was that bird spent half of the breeding season filling up the box with nesting material to make it the right size. So we collapsed it to actually a box that was only about um, what, 150 millimetres by about 125 millimetres. And they used it quite happily. Uh, in, in the particular gentleman's place where we did um, some of the early work, he put up one box and then they bred and put up another one, the offspring. And eventually he had these boxes about every five meters around his house. Oh, yeah. And he had, that's for these striated hard loads where they're found. And he had in total, I think it was 12, somewhere between 12 and 15 breeding pairs <laughs> of hard loads. By comparison, something like um, an Adelaide Rosella, if you read Hansab, which is really the Bible of, of our knowledge added to the question was there are, given that um, Hansab says they breed about 50 metres apart, in my experience, um, if they're less than 10 metres apart, they fight unbelievably. And I've seen two male birds start a fight about 20 metres off the ground and not finish till they hit the ground. And yet if they move slightly further apart, we've had 15 or ideally 20 metres apart, then they become less anxious and they will breed that far apart. If there is a visual barrier between them, so if one's on one side of the house and one's on the other side of the house, or there's dense foliage in between them, then it doesn't become such an issue. Um, and once you cross that species barrier, the um, Adelaide rosellas don't like um, other parrots nesting really close to them, but once they're say 10 metres away, it becomes much less of an issue. Uh, rainbow lorikeets can nest closer, um, other species. We just don't have a handle on because we don't see it often enough that they are nesting that closely. Okay, 
All right, look, I'd just like to call the questions to a close and thank you very much, James, for a fabulous, so much information there. Uh, very informative talk. And uh, we really appreciate you bringing your life's work to us tonight. Thank, thank you very much. My pleasure.